This first session, we're going to talk to the top guns of cybersecurity and resilience. So as I'm making my remarks here, Ryan and the team from CISA and a few other organizations, make your way up to the stage. And uh, we're going to talk about um, things that we can't see, the stuff that Norm just kind of set up. But I can tell you this, I worked with Ryan, and everyone is going to self-introduce, so I'm not going to read the bios, but in your resource manual, you've got the bios for most of our presenters today. I had the privilege of working with this crew uh, with my affiliation uh, with the Arizona Healthcare Association and a grant-funded program that we have called the Disaster Ready Grant, where we help our long-term care providers um, be ready for every type of emergency. Um, talk about the power of collaboration. Last year in this room, we had a presentation from um, CISA, and Ryan, you can explain all those acronyms when we get to that point. Um, no, it wasn't CISA, it was ACTIC that was here presenting. And because of that presentation, I was able to reach out to them, connect with Ryan, and we did a series of training and tabletop exercises for long-term care providers in the state in three different locations so that they could be ready for the things that uh, can't see but can hurt it, can hurt us. So Ryan, without further ado, I'm passing this to you and you've got the segment. Uh, and feel free to walk test, around test. too. Yep. Awesome. Uh, and I don't know if we actually have any slides here. I'll advance the next one and see what's up there. I think that's all of our faces and our logos. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Murray. I am the Deputy Director for the Arizona Department of Homeland Security over our statewide information security and privacy office. I also serve as the Chief Information Security Officer for the state of Arizona. Uh, we'll quickly go into introductions here, but the reason we wanted to come talk to you is, as Stan mentioned, we've been going around the state talking to other healthcare organizations about what cyber threats look like, running some exercises, and really making sure that people understand what resources are available. So I'm here from the state. We have our federal partners here. Uh, let's just go into introductions. Jerry, uh, you want to talk about yourself and who you're here representing? Good morning, everybody. My name is Jerry Keeley. I'm a cybersecurity advisor for the um, for CISA, which is the um, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency of the Department of Homeland Security. That's a mouthful. And um, I work with these guys. We do tabletop exercises, and we help work with, um, with healthcare facilities and the vulnerable populations and provide uh, a bunch of free services. Um, so if you're not familiar with CISA, I certainly encourage you to reach out to us because everything we do is free, and we offer our cyber training, uh, risk assessments and, uh, and, and training people, um, security awareness training for um, either residents of your facilities or your staff. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, so, Troy, you're here from HHS. Talk to us a little bit about who you are and uh, the organization you represent. Certainly. Happy to do so. Uh, my name is Troy Adams. I'm uh, with the uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. My unit is HC3, which is the Health Sector Cybersecurity Coordination Center. We provide uh, a number of services around the country to help to level up in terms of operational resilience, and cybersecurity hygiene uh, for HPH entities throughout the nation. Uh, today, I'm actually representing uh, InfraGuard. So InfraGuard is a public-private organization uh, built on protecting critical infrastructure, all different types of critical infrastructure. So if you're interested in, in joining a community that is uh, built on uh, protecting critical infrastructure, come and talk to me, uh, or actually several of us are members of InfraGuard, and we'll, we'll be happy to talk to you about that. So uh, in, in addition to that, I, uh, I'm wearing my ASU colors, so I am an instructor. I teach cybersecurity at ASU Poly, um, and we're very happy to talk to you about that as well. Matt? Thanks, Troy. Uh, and then Matt, Special Agent Chastine is here from the FBI. Would you like to uh, introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what you're here to represent? Uh, yes, as mentioned, I'm Special Agent Matt Chastain with the FBI. Um, I work cybersecurity, or <coughs> cyber investigations, focusing on cybersecurity uh, with folks. Um, other than that, uh, we'll get into it with the panel on kind of how we, the FBI looks at stuff, but I'm here for when uh, things have already happened and you need someone to help you. So uh, as you'll see, we've got a fantastic representation here. And as our, introduced, uh, our host introduced, uh, what we're talking about is cybersecurity. And nowhere else are the threats that we're facing able to reach into our organizations from overseas, from other nations. Uh, if someone were to roll up with tanks or guns to our organizations, 
we have a way to respond to that, right? We would be taking this seriously. It would be an absolute threat against our buildings, our people, and the services that we provide. The problem with cybersecurity is you don't see it until after it's already happened, after it's turned into a bad day. But let's talk about what that looks like. So we know we're facing constant cyber attacks. We know we're facing cyber threats. What are some of the most significant cyber threats that you guys are seeing in each of your various roles, specifically targeting healthcare organizations or those underserved populations that we're all trying to support? And then how can we, as organizations, proactively address some of these risks to ensure that we can continue to provide those critical services? Is that to me? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the biggest vulnerabilities or risks that we face, especially in medical, but all critical infrastructure, is um, vulnerability or patch management. Systems that aren't kept up to date and have these known vulnerabilities sitting out there for these uh, cyber criminals overseas and uh, um, in the US to go after and uh, exploit you. And then the other real critical one is the biggest vulnerability you all have in your environment is the users, right? And so user training, end user training is absolutely paramount to make sure they understand that they have a role in cybersecurity. Everybody does, everybody in this room does. And um, because they are the biggest risk. And these cyber criminals are really good at social engineering people and getting them to fall for clicking on links and opening attachments and things like that. And um, that's how they're getting in your back door or actually almost your front door. So really, um, um, engaging all employees and all staff, and even residents in, in, if you're in that type of industry, to understand that they have a role, they, they can be a vulnerability to you, but they also can be a cyber warrior for you if you get them trained up and make sure that they help protect your front door. So it's a really great point, right? Looking at what, where are we vulnerable, right? What are the bad guys trying to take advantage of and how do we best defend against those things? Troy, how about you? You have a unique perspective, both from the healthcare side as well as sort of the broad infrastructure, critical infrastructure, InfraGuard perspective. What are some of the threats you guys are seeing? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of broader than that. Um, certainly we have, have to worry about things like ransomware and, and other attacks. And definitely we, we think about, you know, uh, protecting our various facilities. Uh, people is, is the, the hardest nut to crack, right? So uh, anyone have a car in here? When you walked away from your car, did you lock it? Everybody did that, especially where we are. So we locked our car. Um, you know, in, in cybersecurity, we need to think about how we're protecting our users. and. Clearly, there are methods or controls that we can implement that can automate that process. The, the one that helps the most is multi-factor authentication, which can help with a wide number of threats, a wide number of threat vectors. And if you have that little component in place, you can negate a lot of the different uh, threat actors who are trying to get into your systems. So uh, again, and it's not the only one, you still need to back up your data, You'll, you still need to have an N plus one or perhaps an N plus two mentality of every little piece of your, of your infrastructure. So if you do get attacked or you do have some kind of uh, climate event, uh, you do have the, the fallback and, and that's in terms of people, process and technology, right? So going back to paper, when things hit the fan so that you can actually react and you don't have to send your patients elsewhere. Very, very important. So really great point. Both of you guys are focused on the defensive capabilities of trying to prevent bad stuff from happening. So Matt, from your perspective, you guys come in when the bad day has already happened. What are some of the most impactful threats that you're seeing? The stuff that's made it through all of these defenses that is actually causing bad days for people and what are you guys seeing out there? <clears throat> Thanks, Ryan. Um, for the most part, uh, ransomware is actually pretty low on the, the, the pecking order of uh, cybercrime that we see, that we deal with. Uh, our job is to come in after the fact, try to attribute um, who the threat actor is, uh, try to investigate that, and then try to uh, reach a prosecution and hold the threat actors accountable. Um, from that standpoint, investment fraud is the number one cybercrime uh, across the board. Um, it's up there with uh, business email compromise, impersonations, uh, but investment fraud, elderly scams, that kind of thing is uh, number one. Um, but then we get down to ransomware is fairly on the low end, although a lot of it's not attributed to things other than the cost of the actual ransom, but uh, the impact uh, to hiring a third party company, the lost time at work, lost labor, lost production, all that stuff. And some companies, 15 minutes down is millions of dollars. 
Um, so if you imagine being down for a day or two, uh, you're losing uh, a lot of money. So uh, from that standpoint, I'll just put the plug out now, have backups that are offline, that you can at least get your organization back up and running, and then worry about recovering your data after that. Um, but data exfiltration for ransomware, uh, sometimes we've seen ransomware actors not even exfil data anymore. Uh, just steal it and see if you'll pay. Um, and usually ransoms start pretty high and they usually come down with negotiations. Uh, but I'll put the plug in now, the FBI does not encourage paying ransoms. <laughs> so uh, but back over to you, Ryan. Awesome. So I'm, I'm glad we sort of touched on ransomware. Everyone know what ransomware is? Anybody not? Okay. So uh, just to touch on this, thank you for guys for raising your hand. Uh, nothing wrong with not knowing about this. So ransomware is essentially a piece of malicious software that is installed in your organization's environment that will lock up your systems, lock up your data, and then the threat actor will ask you to pay money to unlock it. And unfortunately, we're also seeing second and third order extortion along these same attacks where they lock up your data and ask you to pay to unlock it. If you won't do that, then they'll threaten to leak your data out to the internet or out to the public. A lot of times, especially if we're talking healthcare or government entities, this is sensitive or confidential information that we definitely don't want out there in the public. Uh, and then the third piece of this is they will threaten to either take your infrastructure offline, DDoS attacks, uh, threaten to basically cripple your business if you don't pay them. We're also seeing, especially in healthcare and public education sector, where people are threatening to leak this information to friends and family members on their mental health status, on any of the other potential sensitive information, uh, using it as another extortion method. So really, really ugly, nasty people doing bad things to some of the most vulnerable populations uh, across the state and across the nation. And unfortunately, it doesn't just hold itself to a bad piece of software got installed. Uh, they're looking to how do they pivot this to other extortion methods. But let's talk a little bit about that. There's really two pieces here. There's ransomware that will prevent these systems from functioning. All, everything is locked up. You can't conduct business. But also potential access to sensitive information, patient care information, uh, all the other things that you guys are holding sensitive and, and protected. So how can healthcare organizations and other uh, organizations that are represented here, how can they better protect themselves and better prepare or defend against these types of attacks, not just from a preventing them from happening, but how do they make themselves resilient to these things so if they do occur, they can better recover? Jerry, let's start with you. So a few things is, um, so CISA sits to the left of Boom. We're there to help you prepare, same with HS, HSS. Um, and so we provide risk assessments, we do vulnerability scanning and, uh, and end user training and things like that. Uh, to help you better prepare. And what we also do is we perform tabletop exercises because having an incident response playbook in the event of you running into one of these uh, situations, knowing what to do is very important and who does what, when, and where. But if you put on a piece of paper and nobody knows what their role is, it's practically worthless. So having these tabletop exercises allows you to understand whose role is, um, who, who does what, and what your, uh, where your gaps are, what you're not prepared for, and it helps you uh, fill out your preparedness uh, plan uh, in the event one of these things happen, um, especially those of you that are uh, managing healthcare facilities, there could be lives at the other end of this. And um, so you need to act fast and you need to be prepared and everybody needs to be all on the same page. So that's a really important aspect of that. And then the other, the other piece I mentioned earlier was the vulnerability. We do provide free vulnerability scanning through CISA of all your external facing devices. That's exactly what Russia, China, and Iran are doing to your systems right now. And so we provide free vulnerability scanning. The difference is we're gonna give you a report every Monday to tell you what vulnerabilities you have so you can fix them so that they don't get exploited by the bad actors. And Troy, you have to on that. I'll, I'll kind of reiterate um, by asking a question. And he's, he's already said it a number of times. That sounds expensive, Jerry. What does that cost? <laughs> Thank you, Troy. Nothing, all right? Um, we, we, we always use the word free, but it's not really free. It's prepaid. You paid your tax dollars. You paid for us and our salaries, and we thank you for that. But the second part of that is put us to work. Make us earn your earn your income from you. And so put us to work. Thank yep. you. No additional cost, right? No it's additional already paid cost. for. So my organization at HHS, we, we do offer the tabletop exercises as well, but also a lot of uh, operational level uh, documentation, things like training, uh, things like uh, um, analyst notes, uh, sector alerts, and also free briefings on a monthly basis. Um, but uh, 
you know, given the organization I'm, I'm actually representing here, which is InfraGuard, the important thing that I want to impress upon you is information sharing. So we're talking um, within your organization, certainly you, there, you need to share information, make sure that your incident responders know what's going on, but also between organizations. So your third party vendors, your other stakeholders that are either within your industry or adjacent to your industry so that they can help to react to that. Or in the case of the left of boom mentality and boom, again, that's your incident. Left of boom is preparing for the incident. Right of boom is where you're calling the FBI. Okay, so when we're preparing for boom, we need to be able to share that information with our other partners and your other part, the list of your other partners could be a long list. And for some of them to be prepared for boom to happen, but not all of them can really put you behind the eight ball. Well said. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about responding to a ransomware attack. What does that look like from the FBI's perspective? So say I get locked up with ransomware, I call you and say, I don't know what to do. I can't get into my stuff. What, what are you guys doing to help respond to this? Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, that's a bad call to make. <laughs> um, but yes, you'll want to call the FBI. Um, and when I call the FBI, um, that could have been established before uh, the boom happened. You could have had a, uh, a relationship with your local field office, cyber task force, could be uh, tied into our cyber task force. So we can uh, point you to resources or um, provide information on what we're seeing threat-wise. Um, so that before boom happens, but after boom, um, you're gonna wanna report it. That's the first thing you'll wanna do, uh, especially depending if it's a ransomware attack, for sure. We may be able to assist you, we may not. Um, but if it's something else, let's say a, a, a compromise where there's money involved, the quicker you report it, the faster we might be able to freeze those funds so you don't lose your money. Uh, and, and so, but, Focus back on ransomware, um, ic3.gov, you'll wanna go to ic3.gov and file that complaint. Um, it specifically will provide you the space to put in the information that you need to pass to us and get more details and maybe say calling um, the national hotline, which you could call 1-800-FBI as well. Um, either of those two sources can get you to uh, a resource, which then will typically be your local field office. So if you filed something here in Phoenix, it would come back to the Phoenix field office, even though it went through our national headquarters, it would make its way back to here, probably within 24 hours, and then you would be getting a call from uh, someone on the cyber task force uh, to get information and to collect information from you. Sometimes that's all we can do is collect information, um, but sharing that information with us helps assist uh, other victims in the future, helps us assess, uh, importantly, the IOCs, the incidents of compromise, um, sorry, indicators of compromise, and so those IOCs help, uh, we share those with the, usually there's a major case team and the way the FBI handles ransomware is wherever the first instance of that ransomware is, whatever field office, that field office owns it and owns the whole country. Um, so we feed that uh, information back to that major case team who's working on it. And sometimes that major case team, as you've seen in the news, is able to have impactful um, <clears throat> impact on the, on the threat actors, such as say Lockbit or a few other ones, but um, so, that also, there's a slight chance that if you provide information to us and alert us to which uh, variant of the ransomware it is, uh, we may have decrypt decryptor keys uh, that we may, may be able to share, or we may be able to point you uh, not um, to any one vendor, uh, but we may have knowledge of some vendors that have uh, decryptor keys available. Um, so um, that sharing of information is what we find the most important. Uh, and then we also may be able to give you some advice and say, hey, we've noticed that uh, this threat actor, um, yeah, they start out at $5 million, but sometimes they go down as low as 50000 So again, the FBI doesn't recommend paying a ransom, but you may be able to negotiate it down to uh, a more manageable number uh, that your organization uh, can, can stomach. I think that's an important point to make, right? We, we talk about we don't encourage people to pay the ransomware, but ultimately that's going to be a business decision. Uh, we don't want to continue putting money in the pockets of the bad guys who are doing these attacks against us. But if it comes down to your organization is shutting down and going out of business, or you can pay $10,000 to a bad guy to get all your data back and continue to run, that's not something any one of us is going to tell you what one way to do or the other. 
Uh, so I, I think it's an important distinction to make that uh, while we may encourage, let's not uh, let's not tell people what to do, right? And, and on the and on those lines, um, I like to just remind people too that, uh, especially to victims, that if you are a victim of a ransomware incident or a victim of a cyber incident, uh, maybe an investment fraud or a scam, uh, cryptocurrency scam, something like that, uh, romance scams are big. Um, that the people that do this are professionals and they, they're good at it. So uh, victims often feel uh, there's some victim shame, uh, but uh, that's, the FBI is not there to judge you, the FBI is there to help you. Um, so just keep that in mind that people that are doing this, they're good at it. So. Yeah, and I would say that kind of goes for everything and this ties into sort of the next question is, we are all here to help. I know there's uh, oftentimes a reluctance to report, hey, I've been attacked or I've become a victim of some sort of cyber attack. Uh, to the government because you don't want that information to get out there, especially if you're a private industry organization, uh, potential you know, shareholder conversations, if you're a publicly traded company, all of this information getting out into the public is going to be hurtful and damaging, but we are all very well versed in ensuring that this information remains confidential and providing especially to you guys the, the best support that we possibly can to make sure that happens. But let's, let's talk a little bit more about information sharing in community, because I think that's something that's really critical and something, frankly speaking, I feel like we do really well here. Uh, who here is uh, from a government entity within the state of Arizona? Let's raise your hands high. Come on, be proud of it, guys. <laughs> nice. So maybe half the room. Uh, so if you aren't already aware, as a government entity, my office provides also free cybersecurity tools and capabilities to all of you. Uh, we also run an information sharing organization to make sure that we are sharing cyber threat attack information, as well as any vulnerabilities that are potentially out there. Uh, we also run our cyber command center out of the ACTIC. Any, who else is here from the ACTIC? One hand, <laughs> all right, uh, thank you. Uh, so the ACTIC, for those that aren't aware, is the state's fusion center, the Arizona Counterterrorism Information Center. Uh, our cyber command center also operates out of this facility. Uh, it's the state's location to fuse and share information, both from a law enforcement perspective, but also an all threats, all hazard perspective. So we're trying to make sure that we're building this into everything we do in the state of Arizona. So you guys are here from the federal government and you're here to help. How is the federal government collaborating to help make sure state and local governments as well as our, our private businesses here within Arizona are best protected and able to respond to cyber attacks? Uh, let's start with you, Troy, and then we'll go to the other two. Well, we could talk about a, from a grassroots approach and that's what our engagement personnel are for, right? So that's why I have my job is I engage with what we call HPH entities around the country but we could also be talking from a policy perspective. Has anyone heard of CIRCIA? CIRCIA, anybody? CIRCIA is a new law. It was enacted in 2022, and I'll, I, I should probably pass the mic to Jerry to talk about CIRCIA, but um, it is the answer, the federal government's answer to all of the attacks. We have to be able to do something, and if, if the government doesn't know about it, it can't act on it. So, Jerry, do you want to talk about that? So, um, CIRCIA is still a, a work in progress. Uh, right now, if you guys want some light reading, there's about a 350-page document open for public comment right now um, in CISA. Uh, and uh, they're collecting all the comments, and we're hoping to weed through some of those. They're, they're responding to them currently, and uh, they will continue to, and then we're going to start enacting that. The, the piece that hasn't come around yet is the enforcement side of that. So, um, but start thinking about that right now is if, you, if your agency um, does suffer an, an event, especially if you're private sector, think about how, um, how you would report that information and have a plan in place so that when somebody is knocking on your door saying, now it's a law, you must re report this, figure out what you're gonna report and also communicate that to your employees and your, uh, and your, your shareholders and things like that to understand what, how this law impacts you but at the end of the day, the real goal there, like Troy said, is to get that information in a central location, just like we do with, with Ryan in the state, and distribute that, not without attribution, but let people know what to look for. If you get an email from a certain sender, or if there's a certain a uh, action that they're doing, letting everybody know that this is out there, you know, through public service announcements or some type of communication, so that you can defend against it. Because if it's happening to somebody else, 
they're going, it's going to happen to you. I mean, these criminals keep retooling and reusing their tools, and, if, and the more successful they are, the more they're going to get used. I, I would just foot stomp on that a little bit. It, not that it's going to happen to you, it is happening to you, right? Like, Good point. if they're attacking your neighbors, they're attacking you with the same things that are happening, regardless of sector, regardless of size. Uh, these bad guys are looking for targets of opportunity and they will take advantage of any vulnerability that they find to, to exploit. How about Matt? Any, any perspective from the FBI on how you guys are collaborating at the federal level, either with other federal organizations or with state and local governments and private sector? Um, I'll just say that um, that is one thing that we try to do very well. Um, uh, we have 56 field offices. We have cyber task force in every field office. We have a headquarters. Uh, we have a side watch that you can reach out to for information. That's a resource. Uh, they look at all the stuff going on around the country. So, like, that's the one thing the power of the federal government has is we see what's going on everywhere. Um, and then we're tied in with a lot of the big corporations. We have hooks into all those. So it's like uh, our our reach is pretty far, uh, but our ability to impact stuff still comes down to people. Yeah, great point. And, and I'll I guess I'll throw that back out to us as the collective audience, what can we do to better collaborate with all of you? Anyone want to take a, take a stab at that one? The first step is to reach out, yeah. to know that we're here, to send us an email or give us a call and interact with us in the communities that you already belong to, right? I, I think that's critical. You already belong to an organization. Um, they may not know these services are available. Knowledge is the first step. And then we take other steps from there to better prepare against all kinds of threats, not just cybersecurity threats. Yeah, and um, kind of like what, um, what Matt, Matt had mentioned, um, is um, develop a relationship with your federal partners, with your state partners, with the ACTIC, and already know who to contact and have a relationship with them. So it's a, it's a phone call that you can make and you know who's on the other side of that phone um, before a bad day happens. Have a relationship with FBI. So when you do end up having to call Cyber Command out, they, uh, they have, you have a relationship. You know who you're calling. You know who you're talking to. They may know a little bit more about your organization. Work with Troy if you're in a health health organization and um, establish a relationship with their tools and resources, as well as with his InfraCard uh, hat that he wears. Work with work with CISA. We um, we provide access to a lot of the three letter and four letter agencies out there, as well as all the free tools and resources that we can do to help you mitigate those risks. And we are also a good conduit for communicating. So if you're if you're working with me and you send me some information, I can anonymize that information and make sure that the ACTIC and um, and Ryan's team has that information, so they can share those indi indicators of compromise with other agencies as well, so they can try to defend them. So it, it's a great point, right? Is because we want the information to be shared out there, but we don't necessarily want to out any one organization. Uh, how do we get that actionable information to the to the hands of the cyber defenders who can do the most with it? Uh, and I know everyone has heard of the FBI, right? Everyone, yeah. Everyone maybe didn't know that HHS had a cyber component or that InfraGuard is a thing that exists. How how many people this is the first time you've heard of CISA? Sorry, Jerry. <laughs> so we, we got our work cut out for us to get the word out there. How many of you, this is the first time you heard from me talking about what the Arizona Department of Homeland Security is doing on cybersecurity efforts? Yeah, I definitely have my work cut out for me. So uh, any of you who are on the government side, please come talk to us after the fact so we can make sure that you've got our contact info and we can share what we can, what we can share with you uh, on the resources that we can provide. So uh, I do want to talk a little bit more because we have been talking specifically on the defensive side, on the collaborative side of, of how do we share information. Uh, but when we do have a bad day, uh, this is almost entirely going to be the response efforts of those cyber defenders, of the IT organizations, uh, of the, the businesses that are impacted by this. Uh, what can we do collectively to help respond to these sorts of attacks? Who should people call? What should be sort of my first line when I need help? Who do I reach out to? Well, since we all work closely together, um, I can confidently say you can reach out to any one of us because we do work well, we know, and if we're not the right person, we know a person, right? And so, uh, again, developing that relationship with, with any one of us um, or all of us, and we can help uh, filter that out because we face these, uh, we face these calls all the time. And if I work closely with an agency and I'm the known person, they'll reach out to me, but I'm not necessarily the right person to talk to, but if I need to have them reach out to local law enforcement or the FBI or HHS or uh, Ryan's team, I'll make sure I put them in touch with them. So how do we get a hold of you? 
My contact information's right up there, and um, we didn't put our phone number on, I noticed. Oops. Okay. We'll um, make sure to add that. Yeah, we'll need, we'll need to add that, but yeah, just um, reach out to me, and I also have a coworker back here that is my partner in Arizona, Kelly, stand up. So Kelly Hills, she covers the Phoenix area and Northern Arizona. I cover Southern Arizona and Tucson primarily, and so we are your cybersecurity advisors, and so I purposely had her name up there as well because we're, we're partners in this, and reach out to us at, as well as make sure you get all of our contact information because we are all just resources for you. Troy, clearly, right? clearly within an organization, you need to have an, uh, an incident response plan. Does anyone know if they've got an IRP? We've got a few hands. Nice. So if you IRP. don't already have an IRP, you need to make one. There's lots of templates out there that you can use to build one, right? So when boom happens, you need to know what to do in terms of recovering from the disaster or who to make a phone call to. And, you know, within the organization, usually that bubbles up to the top. Uh, sometimes, or should I say most of the time, uh, the call goes to the insurance provider or to the, uh, the legal team. And sometimes that's where the information stops. It can't stop there, especially if you want to stop the attacks. If we want to stop the attacks, we need to share information so that what impacts one of us doesn't continue to impact all of us. Well said. Matt, how about you? How does the FBI help us to respond to, to a bad day? Um, well, like I, said, like I said earlier, Ryan, um, you want to file that report with either IC3 uh, or call 1-800-FBI. Uh, the, the FBI kind of restructured after Parkland to push people more towards using that resource as opposed to uh, um, calling the local field office operation center. Um, but that then gives national view to something, an incident that's happening in one area of the country that may be happening somewhere else. So that's the, uh, the one bonus of pushing it through our headquarters. Um, and then that gets uh, immediately pushed down to the field. Uh, once it goes through our system and gets, uh, the report is generated and then it finds its way to its local field office. Uh, and then it, that way it finds its way onto its local cyber, cyber task force my information is up there as well. You can certainly reach out to me. Um, I would I probably then ask you to do the same thing, which is file it with 1-800-CALL-FBI, but giving me a heads up that you're getting ready to file it, uh, that, that, that is a bonus uh, on the reporting side. Um, with that said though, I uh, definitely would encourage to reach out to any one of us and one of us will get you to the right person uh, should you have a question on how to handle an incident and having that plan and having those specific names in that plan on who to call or what agencies to call and having a, a number for that agency, whether or not it's the person or the agency, um, because what if I'm out next week? Um, uh, but there's other people that fill in for all of us. Um, so having that plan is very important. Um, and then um, make sure that uh, you train your people. And as luck would have it, CISA offers a free incident management review program that will either help you develop an incident response plan or help you uh, update yours if you have one that's been around for a long time and just needs updating because the, what the criminals are doing today is not what they were doing five years ago or even two years ago. So it has to be updated and it's a living document and so we can help you with that as well. That's a, that's a really great point. And I'll just add, uh, maybe, you know, so you're gonna call one of these organizations, you're gonna call me, maybe you have your cyber insurance team. Uh, similar if I'm calling 911, it takes time for fire or law enforcement or EMS to show up. What should I be doing, right? The, the first 48 hours of a cyber incident are just as critical as any other uh, incident that's occurring. What should I be doing now while I'm waiting for my incident response efforts to start kicking off? Any advice? Don't panic. <laughs> that's a good one. That's a very good one. Yeah. Well, and, and again, it goes back to have a plan. Know what you're going to do in these events and practice it. Do a tabletop and identify, use your plan to do the tabletop and identify those gaps and make sure you have a plan on what to do because everybody's case is gonna be different. What, how your environment is, um, what systems you use, um, if you're web-based or if you're local-based, they're all very different and these responses are very personal. So you can't just go on the, on the internet and download a, a, an incident response and just plug it into your environment, change the name, it won't work. And so um, having knowing what to do. So he asked the question, what do you do? Well. Have, have your plan designed to tell you what to do. What, what makes the most sense? How, what, what is step one in the event of X? And so you already know how that looks for your environment. 
Can I, can I ask a question? How many of you guys out here, EMS, first responders, law enforcement, anyone? <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, I assume you guys train and exercise on the things you do for your response efforts, right? Uh, you're constantly training to make sure that it's all second nature, it's muscle memory, it's just response. Do the same thing for your cyber incident response plans. So having a plan is great, but if it's a 500 page document that sits on a binder and a shelf that no one ever reads and no one ever talks about, it is absolutely irrelevant. So we need to make sure, partner with us, partner with CISA, HHS, InfraGuard, FBI, we will come out and do tabletop exercises with you and you can run through your incident response plan. Let's test and train and exercise the same way we would for any of our other, other critical response efforts. Again, at no additional cost. At no additional cost, yes, thank you. Free, 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 free. Matt, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just say, I'll just add to that too, that um, when you think about boom, right? What is boom, right? So uh, imagine you come in, you turn on, and you try to turn on your systems and nothing works. Your phones are tied into your computer, your phones don't work. You have no communication with the outside world. You have nothing, right? If you have old phone systems, you might be able to call somebody, but um, uh, it, w and so now you're down to just cell phones. Um, and so think about that when you think about your response plan and what that's gonna look like and what that's gonna do to your organization depending on what your organization does. Um, it's gonna have, could have a serious impact. Again, when we deal with businesses that are producing and production, you're losing money. Uh, when you're dealing with people's lives, now you have people's lives on your hands. And so think about that, um, uh, about what you're gonna do after you have a bad day. And, and I know you guys get this, uh, but think about operational resiliency, right? What do you do if you don't have technology? If you have to revert to paper, if you have to go back to the old school way of doing things, what does that look like? What are your mission essential functions and how do you deal with those when you don't have technology available and make sure that's built into whatever your response process looks like? Because it's going to take time to recover technology after a major cyber attack but you need to continue to support your business, support your customers, support the citizens for whatever you're doing. Okay, with that, uh, I was gonna say, let's go to the audience for questions. I actually had a question about um, resiliency tips for companies who experience a cyber attack, especially like the UK's NHS was attacked. Um, what were some top tips that helped them get through it faster? Yeah, great question. Anyone wanna take that one? Muscle memory. Right, so uh, from, from one aspect, we need an N plus one or an N plus two uh, resiliency program, meaning N is the number of people you need on staff, or N is the number of servers, the number of computers, or the connections to those computers with regard to power or internet. We need not just the primary connection, but also a backup connection to every single critical piece of that infrastructure that you have on site that helps you to fulfill your mission. If there's a certain component that you've only got one of, the potential for it to fail and knock every other pin down is higher. So think about N plus one. And in the case of law enforcement, we have N plus two. Or healthcare, we have N plus two, where we have two backups. And that could be another information system or another uh, element to our diagnostic or clinical systems, but also a backup to those backups. So in the case of healthcare, we, we talk about going back to paper, which unfortunately causes more errors than it should. So that's another reason to practice those kinds of activities. And that's something I want to reinforce here. We need to practice these things so that we have the muscle memory so that when it happens, when our power gets knocked out, when we are attacked by a, a nation state actor from China or Russia or elsewhere, we have the muscle memory to just pick up and move on. And kind of toward your question a little bit there um, is um, you were asking about what you can do to be better prepared against these things, correct? Well, um, one of the things that um, I know they'll do and, then, and we at CISA do is risk assessments. Where, where are you running risk? Every organization has risk. I mentioned earlier patch management, vulnerability management, people management, okay? Those, those are risks, but there are a lot of other risks that entities have, and if you don't know what they are, you're not gonna do anything about them. And so, again, 
bringing in somebody that can help you do these assessments, like Kelly or I, um, we can come in and help you identify those risks and give you some recommendations on how you can mitigate those risks or come up with uh, compensating controls and things like that. And um, then you can use that information even from these other um, events that you read about and hear about. You can take, go back and take a look at if you're running that risk and learn from them, learn from these issues that happen. The media tells us you know, a lot of what, what's going on out there um, and then take a look inside, look back at your entity and say, hey, would we have fallen for this? Would this have been a problem for us? And that goes back, to, that all ties in together, IOC sharing, indicators of compromise. The more we can share about that, the more every one of you can look back inside your industry or your organization and say, is this something that we need to defend against or how do we defend against it? And uh, again, if you don't know what that is, then you're not gonna be prepared. Well said. Matt, did you have something? Yeah, I'll just add to, talking about ransomware and specifically, um, the top three ways that we see the bad guys get in. Uh, 50, over 50% 50 of the time, email phishing campaigns. So just people falling for uh, the phishing campaigns. Number two, uh, RDP, remote uh, desktop uh, access. Uh, people's credentials are getting stolen. Office 365 is a, is, is, is a pretty popular attack to try and get people to log in to their Office 365 accounts and the bad guys are uh, uh, intercepting that. Um, so multi-factor authentication, uh, please. Multi-factor authentication. Um, Anyone, everyone know what multi-factor authentication is? Anyone not know? I'm happy to explain it and show you. The idea is uh, you log into a website. They don't re register. Uh, the, the computer doesn't register with a previous login. Uh, it's not a known computer. So you get an alert on your phone and asking you to put in a passcode. That's just an example of multi-factor. It could be an email, a text. But that, that second level of protection, uh, you should put that on all your stuff. Everything personal too. <laughs> well said. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just curious from your point of view. Um, it happened about a month, month and a half ago. The system shut down with the cyber incident that happened. Social Security Office, MVD. How did that look on your end? Are you talking about CrowdStrike? CrowdStrike. Is that what that? Yeah, so CrowdStrike is an endpoint uh, protection. Um, um, systems basically it's an antivirus but it's advanced antivirus it was not a um, cyber event by the way what it was was they yeah ish they um, pushed out a an update they did automatic updates on all these systems that affected you know airports and banks and everything across the uh, across the world literally and they sent out this update and one of the files was uh, was corrupt causing the system to not respond or go it, basically they wouldn't boot up so it just killed all these computers but kind of leaning into the cyber question side though is the unfortunate part of that was that they um, basically kind of showed cyber criminals how they could really impact the United States and the, actually the global community by going after something like that and doing a system like that. But the lessons learned is they've changed their protocols. Um, they're not using the same file types and they're also allowing people to uh, determine whether or not they apply that update because the problem was you, didn't, you couldn't choose. Uh, Troy's mentioning the N plus one and uh, those kind of things. They didn't allow their customers the ability to say, I don't want the latest and greatest update. I want to be able to take, a, a, take it and put it in a test environment and make sure it's going to work without bringing me down. That was a protocol that was not in place at the CrowdStrike level. So they have implemented that so that now we will, or they're working on it. I, I'm not really sure if they've got it pulled out all the way. But um, now entities will not be forced to take that automatic update and cause them to be brought down. I'll just touch a little bit on the, the question that was asked is, yes, we were absolutely impacted, specifically state of Arizona and local governments, as well as a bunch of businesses across the state, right? It was a major impact. It was a global IT outage. And I'll say, uh, just to highlight the good work of what we're doing here and to, to touch on the point of resiliency and recovery efforts, uh, we had a plan. This happened late on a Thursday night. The state of Arizona and most of our local governments, especially our public safety, were back up and running by about midnight, one o'clock Thursday morning, or Friday morning, rather. Most of our other critical services across state and local government were back up and running before start of business on Friday, which is drastically different from organizations like you see Delta is still in the news talking about how they're being impacted, right? Flights canceled, billions of dollars lost. Uh, so having, having a plan, because this, as Jerry mentioned, this wasn't a cyber attack, but it could have been. Having a plan for resiliency and recovery to know how we respond if there is a major, major outage, whether it's caused by a cyber attack or an IT failure, that's how we see success versus failure. 
So if we're prepared to respond to it, if we have backups, if we have the ability to turn over to paper and other operational responsibilities, uh, it makes it a lot less painful versus those organizations that have zero plan on how to address a major outage. Good question though. Any other questions from the audience? Sounds like no. All right, any final parting thoughts for our audience, guys? Anything you want them to take away from, from this panel? Any action items, calls to action? Well, the action that I, I keep repeating is develop a relationship with, with your partners, your state and federal partners, and you know make sure that they have our contact information and use our resources. Again, I'm free, put me to work, please. Well said. Troy? I would say if it's important to you or your business, and this goes for a personal from a personal perspective as well, if it's important to you, back it up. Have a backup or a backup plan. Uh, use multi-factor authentication. Update your systems, right? Um, maybe you've heard of Patch Tuesday, Microsoft's Patch Tuesday. And it's not just Microsoft, it's Oracle, it's Adobe, it's all these other, Apple. And when, when you receive those patches, make sure that they go on. Because when, when they're pushed out, the time clock has already been running. And when these vulnerabilities that they're responding to with these patches are reported, the time be between their report and when they're automated, the exploit is automated from these cyber criminals is winding down. Right now it's less than 30 minutes, right? So if you've got a vulnerability on your systems, you better have a backup, but definitely put on your patches, update your systems, hopefully automatically. And, and yes, with the CrowdStrike issue, that, that adds more risk. But ideally, the, uh, the, the best thing to do is to, to have an automatic update. Um, and yeah, that's the more questions we could ask about and answer about that. Yeah. Sounds good. Matt, final parting thoughts? Uh, sure. <clears throat> Since we've been focused the last 40, 50 minutes on uh, kind of your companies or your occupations and what you guys do in your work environment. I'll just give you some personal tips. Um, don't click on sponsored links. So those links on the first that come up that are sponsored, don't click on those. Um, you don't want to do that. Um, and then um, how many people know about uh, IoT, what IoT is? Okay, the Internet of Things. Uh, we move more and more towards uh, everything being connected to your Internet. Uh, does anybody know how MGM was compromised in their last hack? I won't belabor it, but it was, I believe it was a thermometer in a fish tank. Uh, the bad guys got into their system that way. So just keep in mind uh, as we move into that, um, your data is out there. Um, if you want to check to see if it's out there, you can go to Have I Been Pwned? Um, uh, you can look that up on Google and just go, and it'll tell you if your data has been, if you, if your data has been released based on your email. Um, it's a good thing to look at and see I did it a few months ago, what, my last tabletop, and uh, mine had been twice my data had been revealed. One was through like a um, uh, eyeglass uh, place I got eyeglasses, got breached. Uh, my wife, 36 times. So, um, so she's on the internet a lot more than I am as far as she's in a lot more things. She's in a lot more social media. She's, you know, uh, and so uh, it's a good resource just to check to see if your data's been out there. Change your passwords. Uh, passphrases are better than passwords. And uh, the longer the passwords, the better. It just takes longer to hack. Long, complex passwords. Your data's out there. Be aware of it. MFA all the things. Patch all the things. I'm missing something. Freeze your credit. Yeah. Have backups and resiliency. And take advantage of all the services that exist out there. Uh, I think I saw a handout here just real quick. I think we've got like 30 seconds. Have I been pwned? P W N E D. Yeah. Awesome. It's like pwned. Yeah. It's owned, but with a. It's a P. repository of hacks. It's H A V E I B E E N P W N E D dot com. Yep. It's where you can look up your email address and it'll tell you whether or not you were impacted by various breaches. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, with that, thank you guys so much for letting us be sort of the opening panel here and letting cybersecurity be the topic of the top of mind. I know it's something that's impacting all of us. 
I'm hoping that you've gotten something valuable out of this. You've got our contact info. Please reach out to us. We are here to help you. And thank you, Stan, and thank you for Copa. For All right, hold on a second, guy. Let's give him a big hand. All right, hold on, Ryan. You're going to stay up there. You guys can and go back to your seats. Um, you know, anytime you go to a conference, we're always looking for actionable information and resources. Uh, Copa in partnership with the Arizona Healthcare Association, uh, was able to provide you in this resource manual a cybersecurity toolkit. Now, the Arizona Healthcare Association, represented by Gil and Kristen here today, uh, is one of the state's long-term care association. We partner with other agencies like Leading Age Arizona, uh, Arizona Department of Health Services, and we were funded to put this toolkit together. And thanks to Ryan and his um, direction, guidance, and resources, um, even though it was uh, put together for long-term care facilities, I think you're going to find some excellent information in here.